Okay, lovely. So this session is scheduled for about an hour and a half. Sometimes we do finish this up early. It depends on, on questions people have. So if you do have questions throughout this event, do pop them into the chat and we'll make a note of them. So we will start off with a presentation that, and then we will go through the questions. We do ask, please try not to ask really specific medical questions. This is better suited for your medical team, but any other questions you have around the topic today, pop them in the chat. So today's topic is all about diabetes and kidney health. We do have somebody with lived experience going to be sharing their, their views, their thoughts later on today in the talk. But I will for now pass over to Dr. Helena and she can tell you all about diabetes and kidney health. Thank you. Thank you, Vicky, for the kind introduction. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. So my name is Helena. I am a clinical academic nurse in diabetes and chronic kidney disease at um, the Royal Free London. I also have a clinical role at Moorfield Eye Hospital where I look after people with diabetes and advanced retinopathy. So bear with me. I'm just going to try and share my screen uh, and then we'll get started. Right. Can you see my screen? Vicky or Harry? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. Right, thank you. Let's get started. So what we'll be looking at today is really the links between diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And the particular focus is really to talk about um, urine, albumin, creatinine ratio testing, a mouthful, but I will go in detail as to what that is and how we do it and why it is important. Um, so the agenda for today, uh, we will start looking at some of the background data, that's statistical data about the prevalence of diabetes and chronic kidney disease, both in terms of the global perspective as well as in, in terms of our national data, really to define the scale of the problem and how best we manage these conditions. We will then look at the burden of uh, disposed condition, both to the individual, the person living with the condition, and I know some of you on the call are living with the condition, one or um, the other, or both, um, and its burden in, into our society as well as our healthcare system. We then look at some of the risk factors for diabetes kidney disease, what we know from research, and touch upon the optimal ways of managing diabetes kidney disease. In addition, I will share some of the challenges perhaps of managing uh, diabetes or glucose levels in the context of kidney disease. If we have time, I will share some data from the work that I do in North Central London, particularly in the dialysis unit, uh, to really uh, look at some of the key areas of managing uh, diabetes in, in the context of dialysis or uh, low clearance, um, which I'll come into to explain in a bit. And I will conclude by summarising what we looked at today. I'm happy to take questions, so if you have questions, please pop them on the chat. Then at the end of the presentation, I'll look at each question and try and answer them. Like Vicky mentioned, I probably won't go in detail of, you know, some of the medication and management on individual basis, but I suppose I can give a broader advice around managing uh, these conditions. Okay, so uh, moving on. So, you know, I'm sure many people on the call are aware. One diabetes, we're looking at insulin deficiency completely. And then in case of type 2 diabetes, it's a combination of insulin resistance um, and as well. I suppose worth mentioning that there are other forms of diabetes and currently there are about 537 
million people uh, living with the condition and sadly this is predicted to rise to 783 billion by 2045. Here in the UK we had just under 5 million people living with the condition. Chronic kidney disease is a common complication of uh, diabetes and it is defined as abnormalities of the kidney structure or function which is present for more than three months with implication for health. Globally, one in 10 adults live with kidney impairment. And here in the UK, we have approximately 3.2 million people living with chronic kidney disease. So this slide represents the challenges of uh, chronic kidney disease uh, or CKD, which is a, a major global challenge affecting nearly 850 million people worldwide. One of the highest prevalence is in North America, as you can see here, about 14.4%, followed by South America, which is around about 12.1%, and Europe is closely catching up at 11.8%. When I present data like this is we just need to be a bit more cautious in how we interpret this data, because not all healthcare systems across the globe have the ability to do surveillance of chronic kidney disease and simply because of um, resources and as well as infrastructure within healthcare systems. So I guess a good point to start on is actually, you know, what do kidneys do? What's their role in our body? then we then can look at what happens when we have chronic kidney disease. Kidneys have several important functions. They remove waste products while returning much needed components into our blood streams. They regulate our blood pressure. They maintain our blood in a non-acidic um, state or a neutral state, which it refers to the blood pH control. They balance the electrolytes and fluid levels in our body. They also stimulate uh, red cell productions in our bone. So when kidneys are malfunctioning or not working properly, the harmful toxins in our body build or the excess fluid build up in our body and eventually leading into kidney failure. This slide highlights some of the risk factors for kidney disease. Um, however, I think it's worth saying that the cause of kidney disease can be multifactorial, with some factors relating to genetic makeups, others are societal and environmental factor. The most important modifiable factor that uh, we should include or look at is high blood sugar in the context of diabetes, high blood pressure, excess weight, smoking, um, blood lipid abnormalities or blood fat abnormalities. Evidence suggests a link between these factors and arteriosclerosis, a mouthful, but it just simply means hardening of and narrowing of the arteries, which then reduces the blood flow affecting both the kidneys and the heart. Therefore, targeting risk factors such as the ones I've mentioned above um, can improve survival and reduce cardiovascular complications, which is very common in chronic kidney disease, and it also slows the progression of kidney disease into end-stage kidney failure. Right, so this slide highlights the two markers that we use in diagnosing and managing kidney disease. So the first one here, I'll start with the one on the right hand side, um, is an estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is um, on the right hand side, as, as I said, and it has five categories, stages one to five and which indicates how well the kidneys are filtering the blood. Whereas the second measure that we use is a urine test, uh, which is on the left hand side of the screen here. And this one measures the amount of albumin, in the, which is a specific type of protein in which we found in, in the urine. This report, this is usually reported when we do the urine albumin to creatinine ratio test. 
So when the kidneys aren't working properly, the EGFR may be reduced, so this may be reduced, and the albumin levels in, in the urine may be increased, which is a state we call albuminuria, or both of these conditions in some cases, or most cases I should say, um, may occur together. So I'm just going to pop them all in and then I'll start talking. Okay, so now let's look at what these tests tell us. So what I mean by this test is a two test, which is the blood test as well as the urine test. And I'm sure many people on the call have seen this map, this heat map before. If not, I will orientate you. So the green represents a low risk, yellow represents moderate increased risk, the orange represents high risk, and the red represents very high risk. Um, so what you see in the top left hand corner, which is this one, is G1 to G5, that's your EGFR categories. And here what we have is the albuminuria categories A1 to A3. So the risk of progression is assessed based on the combination of EGFR, so which is ascertained from the blood test. So we take a sample of your serum creatinine and calculate EGFR and that gets reported by each lab in the UK. And the presence of urine um, ACR, as you move from top to bottom or from left to right, um, the risk of poor outcome increases. So reduction in kidney filtration together with increase in urine albumin excretion results in three to five fold increase in developing cardiovascular complication. It's a complication to your heart, uh, one of them being heart failure, acute kidney injury and reaching end stage kidney disease. So hopefully um, you've now um, realize the importance of actually having just two metrics in actually quantifying um, and diagnosing and managing chronic kidney disease. I will, uh, let's see. So I now want us to talk about a uh, kidney failure risk equation. So this is a risk prediction tool for uh, people with living with chronic kidney disease stages two five. It assesses the risk of an individual needing kidney replacement therapy within two years or five years. So it es estimates the risk for two and five years. Um, and it uses four variables, and those are age, sex, right, age, sex, and then the urine albumin creatinine ratio test, as well as the EGFR test. Then that to determine the probability of kidney failure. And this can be useful in terms of healthcare professionals on the call. I guess it helps us to triage the management of, um, and referral into nephrology services. And talking about dialysis access placement and planning for um, you know, live kidney transplant. For a person living with this condition, I guess what it can help with is actually understanding the risk of actually reaching dialysis as well as how to then minimize that risk. So it's a useful um, risk equation that was developed in Canada and had been validated in over 800,000 individuals across 30 countries. So going back to um, sort of basic data, I suppose, you know, most people uh, with CKD have develop CKD as a result of the diabetes. So diabetes is primarily responsible for chronic kidney disease, but there are other causes of um, chronic kidney disease, including hypertension, glomerulonephritis, and polycystic kidney disease. So just to give you a, a sort of background, when uh, we look at in terms of dialysis or kidney replacement therapy, obviously diabetes is the leading cause of uh, kidney failure globally and currently just around 4 million people who are using kidney replacement therapy and that's projected to rise to just under 6 billion by 2030. So this slide highlights the societal uh, burden of diabetic kidney
significantly you know multifaceted impacting our healthcare system in terms of direct costs so we have here a cost of diabetes about 10.7 billion and about 60 percent of that is really spent in treating complications and very similarly in uh, management of chronic kidney disease you know a large proportion of that goes into the the management of dialysis um so I guess, you know, for me, the worrying part of it is actually we, we're losing quite uh, a lot of people due to chronic kidney disease prematurely, about 45,000 people each year in the UK. And when we look at hospitalisation, uh, most people's chronic kidney disease tend to stay longer in a hospital and very similar picture for the diabetes population. So addressing the burden requires a comprehensive um, approach which involves prevention strategies, improving healthcare access and robust system that will identify, treat and manage these conditions. Hi there, know I'm just chip in a moment. Um, everyone's microphone appears to be off due to my, according to my systems, but I am hearing a bit of rustling and background noise. So if everyone could just make sure the microphones are switched off, that would be great. Um, sorry for chipping in. It's just uh, trying to get to the bottom of it. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, right, I'm just going to share my, share my screen again. Sorry. Right, can you see my screen? Yes, can I see that? Lovely, thank you. So how can we improve this poor clinical outcomes? I guess to improve this clinical outcomes for people living with diabetes, all of us in healthcare need to collaborate effectively. And here are some of the key areas which I thought would be helpful to for us to look at today in order to uh, prevent this poor outcomes, essentially screening, I guess. Chronic kidney disease is often asymptomatic and many individuals are unaware that they have the disease. So regular screening for CKD is essential, especially in high risk populations, such as people living with diabetes uh, or living with hypertension to prevent any further complications. And we need both the blood and urine tests to um, really provide us an insight into the degree of kidney decline. Along with that then is once we have the test, uh, once we detected any abnormality in kidneys, then we need to be able accurately to stage that uh, based on the EGFR level and the presence of uh, kidney damage based on albuminuria. So accurate coding in primary care is crucial for ongoing surveillance and monitoring of chronic kidney disease. This ensures that patients are correctly identified and managed properly screened and you know following on from that point and the, I guess the third point is about treatment or intervention so prompt intervention is vital so by utilizing appropriate treatments early we can help reduce the progression of chronic kidney disease and its associated complications So by implementing these strategies, we can enhance the detection, diagnosis and management of CKD in people with diabetes and ultimately leading into a better clinical outcome. So in the next slide, we will examine our performance in terms of screening using both the blood test and the urine test. On the left hand side is what we have a blood test data. And then here on the right hand side, I've got the urine test data. So you can see, so each person accounts for something like 5%. So um, where you see, um, you know, obviously the, the results in terms of the blood test here, that we excel in conducting blood tests among individuals with diabetes or those living with hypertension or those that are, have other risk factors, which would then mean that we need to be uh, screening them for chronic kidney disease. However, there is a notable deficiency. So only 55% here for people living with diabetes have their 
urine test done for urine albumin creatinine ratio testing and including those with hypertension is even less 30 only 30 percent and then when you think about those leaving with um you know other risk factor conditions then we're looking at five percent and that's quite poor so addressing this gap is crucial for comprehensive kidney disease screening and management. So we're now going to look at the latest national diabetes audit data from the year 2022 to 2023, which was published at the Diabetes Professional Conference in March uh, or April 2024. As you can see from the bar chart that uh, individuals with diabetes, so what we're looking at as a denominator here is about 3,193,265 uh, patients who took part on the, the, the National Diabetes Audit. Um, they have a higher attainment of recorded diabetes care processes specifically for checking their smoking status, checking their HbA1c level, which is again, you know, 89.9%, uh, checking the serum creatinine, um, serum creatinine values, their blood pressure, as well as cholesterol measurement, and in addition to the body mass index, which is calculated from their weight and height. So we're doing really well on those fronts, I guess. However, the, there is a notable gap when in terms of foot surveillance, we only have 71.9% of uh, people living with diabetes have their foot checked in the previous year. And the urine albumin creatinine ratio testing is not ideal either. It's about 62.6%. So very much like that to be somewhere in the 90s so we can accurately identify kidney disease early. Um, so as you know, in the UK, we, you know, anybody who is leaving with diabetes age 12 uh, and above is eligible to have all this nine process of diabetes care. What we haven't got here is the eye data, which I'll come to in a minute. So all people with diabetes age 12 and over should have all the nine process of care. So when you include diabetes eye screening, then it would make it to, uh, to nine. Um, this includes HbA1c, which is a check of your average blood glucose level over the past three months period, as well as blood pressure check, uh, cholesterol check, simply looking at the fats in the blood, um, both urine test and another blood test for your uh, kidney function check and how well they're working, eye screening, foot inspe inspection, as well as weight and height uh, screening. All these are really key. And the diabetes care process in the UK aims to provide a comprehensive and holistic care to individuals with diabetes, focusing on preventing complication and optimizing health care. So that's what I would want us to do at this point. Um, Harry, if you could share the questions in the chat, um, then, you know, this is an anonymous question, so please um, answer them so we can, you know, will help us really to understand, particularly healthcare professionals on the call, you know, what the barriers are in getting this test done. And firstly, have you had your urine sample taken at your last diabetes check? Um, so if you could vote and um, yes, no, or I don't remember. Um, and then we'll, we'll move on into the next question. So if you haven't had it uh, checked, then what would make it easier for you to have the test done? So it's again another multi, uh, multiple choice question and I wouldn't know who's putting what, so it's anonymous. It's just really to help me in my clinical practices as well as the colleagues on the call to understand and how we can make this easy. And I'm well aware that this, you know, there's, there's been reports that uh, from Diabetes UK, particularly around that people, you know, are finding it difficult to to attend the um, annual checks because of stigma and, you know, fear of discussing things with a healthcare professional, which really makes me uncomfortable and we need to change that. Um, so those will be helpful for us, um, but I'll leave it another minute or so and then we'll carry on with um, our talk.
All right, couple of seconds. Right, thanks everyone who took part in the questionnaire. Um, so Harry, we can just move on to the next slide now. Thank you. Lovely, I'm just gonna minimize that and let's move on. Okay, so this slide um, highlights some of the clinical targets we should aim for, but this are only guide. Uh, so you need to have your individualized target agreed with your uh, diabetes provider. And I guess what I would say is just knowing your number is very important. Uh, you know, what, what's my HbA1c value? Where should it be? Am I heading in the right direction? Do I need help? What can I do to improve that? Uh, very similarly with your blood pressure and I guess you know the two targets in there. So depending on the uh, urine ACR test or urine albumin creatinine ratio test, the, what we aim for your blood pressure may slightly differ. So if you have significant um, albuminuria, then the, the tighter target um, is important for you. Um, however, if you live with diabetes uh, and do not have significant albuminuria, then you know that that probably will be a reasonable target. But all this need to be agreed with your uh, you know diabetes provider, be it in secondary care or primary care. Okay, so this is my favorite slide. Uh, it's a comprehensive pyramid taken from the Cadigo guideline, which is a uh, kidney disease improving global outcome guideline, which is an international guideline. Starts off with the basics at the bottom zone. It's looking at healthy eating, exercising, stop smoking, managing you know your weight, and then stepping it up to uh, you know obviously my diabetes and chronic kidney disease requires the use of medication to control your blood pressure, your uh, blood fat abnormalities, uh, blood glucose levels in addition to lifestyle. So the lifestyle will run across all of the, the layers if you like. Um, and then what we have, uh, so most people with CKD should be managed with statin. This is really to prevent uh, secondary uh, cardiovascular complication and the renin angiosin aldosterone system or SC inhibitor. Um, and SGLT2 inhibitors are um, important therapies that one would need to be uh, on or taking regularly to prevent um, both cardiovascular complications as well as reaching end stage kidney disease. So there are additional options to reducing cardiorenal risk, which is cardiorenal risk is essentially your heart and your kidney risk, uh, which includes agents such as glucagon like peptide one receptor or for short GLP-1 and the class from that will include uh, ozempic or semaglutide and then we now have other uh, agents such as non-steroidal municocortical receptor agonists such as perenanone so all these medications have shown to be effective in managing um, chronic kidney disease delaying the onset of dialysis and reducing hospitalization However, medications such as ACE and ARBs have been around since the 1980s. However, there is evidence that not all people who should receive them based on the national guidelines actually do. So the absence of treatment can lead to faster progression of CKD alongside increased risk of cardiovascular events. Um, so we, you know, now live in the era where we have lots of choices and um, new class of medication uh, to managing diabetes, kidney disease. So it's really exciting time. So the paradigm shift of managing, you know, glucose to actually managing, you know, uh, cardiovascular risk factors as well as actually thinking about, you know, changing the disease pathways. And that we, some of these medications have real powerful data behind them. So the SGLT2 inhibitors have shown in a population level in people with CKD with or without diabetes to reduce kidney disease progression. Um, Ferenanone, which is a class of drug that uh, is a non-steroidal uh, MRAs, 
has been shown in two major trials in diabetic kidney disease to reduce the risk of major adverse kidney and cardiovascular events. And very similarly with the GLP-1 classes have proven to reduce major um, adverse cardiovascular events. And there's some evidence to, to show, I think, was with a recent um, diabetes conference in America that we now have an evidence that these medications can actually uh, delay the onset of dialysis or a poor renal outcome. So lots of choices for, for us to, to offer um, and help people living with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. Um, so I will spend some time to, to describe this because I know it's slightly complicated, but I will try and um, break this down. So what you see in here on the y axis is the EGFR value. So remember the five categories that we have when we looked at um, chronic kidney disease and uh, how you identify and define them. Um, so on here on the x axis, we have number of years. So for example, if you have a, you know, a gentleman or a a lady age 70 with an EGFR of 70 and um, you know if we've not intervened and used this drug what happens here the broken line by the age of 81 he or she uh, would need kidney replacement therapy or dialysis however if we start SGLT2 treatments here and her EGFR is say about 55, what we can do is actually delay the onset of dialysis until he or she gets into 92. So it's a quite a significant amount of years that we will gain by treating people early with SGLT2 therapy. And just taking you back into another scenario with the same person at age 70 with an EGFR of 30 and we have if you don't do anything uh, what would happen is a natural decline of their kidney disease by 73 this person would require kidney replacement therapy or dialysis by intervening um, you know with an SGLT2 therapy here we can actually delay the onset of um, dialysis by three years so the person will get essentially another three years of dialysis free i suppose you know message is let's start this agents early so we can maximize the benefits of uh, the drug and also i mean i work in a low clearance clinic so i think if you can't start it safely do start it there's still benefit to be gained even if we start it late but the the ultimate message is let's start these agents early so we can delay the onset of dialysis. So I'm now going to talk about some of the challenges of managing glucose in the context of kidney disease. So if you have diabetes and you've got chronic kidney disease, um, managing glucose might be slightly tricky. And this is because of a reduced drug clearance, which means the drug tends to stay in our system a bit longer because the kidneys aren't getting rid of it as quickly as they used to. So, and one of the function of the kidneys is really to produce glucose. And when you have kidney impairment, that function uh, gets affected, gets impaired, which leads into systemic metabolic changes, um, which is with decreasing in glucose level and increasing lactate levels. Um, and the kidneys also play um, a large part in insulin breakdown or degradation. So when there's a you know presence of kidney disease, then that also gets impacted. So I guess it's important to to note that with all this is there is increased risk of low blood sugar. So something to to watch out for and think about, um, you know, in terms of agents that one is using, particularly with insulin and sulfonuria, such as glyphosate, drug can accumulate and causing increased risk of hypoglycemia. So having a regular reviews, having your blood glucose check um, is key to minimizing that. I guess, you know, the, the fourth point is there's a limited data still um, in terms of the long term uh, efficacy of some of these drugs, but that's definitely changing was now, you know, we now got 
more and more options in managing diabetes kidney disease. But however, there's a uncertainty in terms of targets um, and risk and benefit of you know what should be the sort of ideal target for HbA1c. Whether HbA1c is a, a true marker when in the presence of kidney disease or something that we need more exploration and research on. Um, so this leads me nicely into, uh, you know, HbA1c, which I know in the previous talks have been uh, covered, one of the care uh, processes of diabetes. It's a gold standard uh, of measuring glucose or glycemia. However, in the presence of kidney disease, it can be affected, so we need to interpret it uh, with caution. Uh, so with low um, hemoglobin levels, we may underestimate the, the actual glucose level. And in presence of iron deficiency, may, we may also look at falsely elevated HbA1c. So it's not, you know, a great marker. Uh, it also does not give us uh, information such as glycemic variability, which is a fluctuation of your glucose in the day or over the, uh, the months or hypoglycemia. Um, so there are you know, advances in technology now. So the continuous glucose monitoring system are um, you know, really useful. And I guess in terms of in, in uh, kidney disease patients, there's a wealth of data from people living with type one diabetes that this technologies improve outcomes, they reduce hospitalization, they reduce glycemic variability and hypoglycemia. What we have in terms of data for uh, chronic kidney disease and diabetes is a US data using a large registry, which shows that uh, continuous glucose monitor significantly reduces the rates of diabetes related hospitalizations, so this is admissions, and insulin uh, treated individuals with type 2 diabetes in advanced CKD. Um, so if you're leaving with um, diabetes and you are on dialysis here in the UK you are and you're treated with insulin you are eligible for um, a freestyle Libre or as a CGM generally so worth having a discussion with your diabetes provider about that and I think I've got a slide this is a, uh, a work that I did in um, one of the satellite units I worked in last year with the assistance of an MSc student uh, from UCL, we conducted a survey to assess the prevalence of impaired hypoglycemia. So what that means is a diminished ability to recognize hypoglycemia, which can be disabling for patients. And our finding reveals that 23% of people with diabetes undergoing hemodialysis and treated on insulin or sulfonuria had impaired hypoglycemia. Uh, we've published this in a BMJ open and this work has been able to uh, help us guide the prioritization of continuous glucose uh, sensor in our unit and it's been really immensely helpful for uh, people that were using it and I had a really good feedback from um, my patient groups. So we've now come to the end of my presentation. So just to recap as to what we've looked at, we looked at the prevalence of diabetes and chronic kidney disease across the globe, as well as in the UK, defining the scale of the problem and highlighting the unmet and unrecognized needs of this population, uh, ways in which we can prevent diabetes kidney disease and how we can manage diabetes kidney disease. And I've touched upon some of the challenges of managing glycemia and the presence of uh, chronic kidney disease. Thank you very much for listening to me. I'm happy to take any questions. I am going to unshare and come to the screen. Thank you. Thank you, Helena. That was really interesting. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. If anybody has any more questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. We do have plenty of time to go through them. I think um, we also have uh, Andrew's story, I believe. Yes. Yes. Are we, should we share that now, Harry? What do you think, Helena? Helena? Uh, I think that's a good point. And then we can have plenty of time for q and A. Is that all right? Good idea. Let's do that. Thank you. Give me a moment. Hello, my name is Andrew Freeman, and I'm here to talk about my diabetic to kidney disease 
journey. At 30 years old, um, I'd had a very, very normal life. And then I was diagnosed after some rapid weight loss and um, urgent use of the toilet, having taken on an awful lot of liquids on a very regular basis with type 1 diabetes. And I lived with diabetes um, for 20 years and I tried to manage it to my very best of uh, my ability by counting carbs, by changing my diet, by changing my lifestyle in order to have some balance. It was difficult for me. Um, I found that at one point I had reflux, which made my carb counting and my food intake very, very difficult. Subsequently, uh, I was having an annual check 20 years later on my journey and um, my bloods were diagnosed and I was asked to come back in six weeks time. I returned in six weeks and asked to come back in another six weeks. At that point, I was referred to my renal team and the renal team said to me, Andrew, um, dialysis. And I said, yes. And they said, you need it. And I said, um, when? And they said, actually, Andrew, really quite urgently, your kidneys aren't working, working that well. Um, I was obviously shocked and I tried to find material about um, CKD or DKD. Um, it was difficult. I was on dialysis at home, which is uh, called PD, um, and it didn't sit very well with me at all. The constant connected to a machine every night, the uncontrollable sweating. Um, I couldn't eat the foods that I've been eating as a diabetic, and yet I was trying to manage my diabetes alongside dialysis. Um, and I became really, really fortunate that I was able to be uh, able to receive kidney and pancreas transplants. SPK. Uh, on the third admission, I managed to have successful uh, transplants. Unfortunately, I had sepsis afterwards three times, but um, I managed to to get over all of this and leave hospital to come out to uh, COVID, which was unfortunate. So I was locked down for another year. And then I decided that actually, why didn't I know about this silent disease? Why didn't I know anything about the symptoms or whatever? that can be simply picked up by doing a urine test once a year or speaking to your GP and getting regular control. You control your diabetes and it's hard. So look after your body, get your kidneys checked. Things can be done to manage your kidney function. You don't all, everybody will get, everybody won't get to a decline as I did. So I'm asking you to just take care, look after yourself, try and avoid some of the journey that I had to go through. Thanks so much. Goodbye. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Harry. Okay, if we go through some of the questions now then, um, like I say, pop some in the chat. We still have time. So if you do think of anything, please do ask away. Um, Okay, let's go through what we've got at the moment. So please, can you explain more about sex being a factor in the kidney failure risk equation? Um, thank you, that's a great question. Um, so what, what we know is uh, more female tend to leave with chronic kidney disease. Uh, so I would imagine that's probably what they took into account uh, in putting that variable into a uh, the risk equation. But when you look at kidney replacement therapy, however, you tend to see more males going into dialysis. So I, I am not, you know, I'm quite puzzled by that. Um, female tend to leave longer. Um, and I wonder whether that's another factor. And when we talk about chronic kidney disease, really we're looking at, you know, in majority cases of leaving, people leaving was, uh, was a condition are age 65 and above but it's not uncommon to see it in a younger population as well so all the other um explanation that i could give is um some of the agents uh, that we use in terms of protecting the kidneys uh when you're a childbearing age woman you you wouldn't you know people are worried about you falling pregnant with the agent so therefore they wouldn't necessarily uh, offer it to you um, 
and would that then increase your risk of actually later developing chronic kidney disease? You know, I'm sure that's another contributory factor. So I only can imagine that this was factored in in the kidney uh, risk um, equation to, to think about all these factors that I've just mentioned. Um, yeah, um, I think that's where I'll stop. If you've got further follow-on questions, do, do put them on the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, so there was a question in the chat, but I see that you've replied. Can you give us the equation for working out the risk of CKD? So you put a, a link in, so I think I'll just direct people there if you want to find out more about that equation. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question that says, how do hormones play a part? Um, right, do you want to be a bit more specific? I guess, you know, I touched upon it earlier on. I guess, you know, pregnancy is another risk factor which will affect your kidney function. Uh, you know, it's just simply increased volume going through your system um, of, you know, um, I suppose I am not quite sure um, which hormone specifically that you, you're referring to, but I would imagine there will be some factors, but I will have to look at the literature. So I don't want to give people information that I'm not 100% clear on. So I'm happy to come back to you if you've got specific questions on that. Thank you. Um, so Tracy, you asked that question. So if there are any follow-ups to that one, um, please do let us know. Uh, we've got another question here. What training is out there to reduce glycemic variability? Some of us with type one have never had structured education at all, but is keeping GV down the best way to reduce CKD? That's a great question. My entire PhD was looking at glycemic variability and risk of developing end stage kidney disease. So something very close to my heart, I do think that it has a powerful information that would predetermine your sort of risk, I guess, is what I would say, at least from a kidney perspective. And a very similar data has been shown in uh, retinopathy risks as well. What I will say is how do you reduce glycemic variability? Um, so if you think, if you're living with type one diabetes, I guess the answer is perfect now because we got the hybrid closed loop, which will tightly keep you within a good range without you having a huge variation in your glucose level, which is your glucose variability. And of course, glycemic variability and glucose variability are slightly different concepts. So the glucose variability is your blood sugar, what you see on your CGM data, your finger prick results, uh, whereas your glycemic variability is looking at the HbA1c variation over time. Um, so I guess the answer to fixing glycemic variability is, I think, a hybrid closed loop. Um, how do you do that until you get into uh, your hybrid, hybrid closed loop? Um, I know not everybody's starting at, as we speak and there is prioritization on the national level as to who should go for this uh, therapies. Um, so I guess is to look at your pattern. So where where you know you can look at your activities and can that be managed and it's it's not easy i think the technology can do it much easier than you know you trying as as an individual is what i will say thank you thank you um we don't have any more questions in the chat we do still have time so if anybody has any please do pop some in there um yeah. harry has just put in some um, links to our social media platform so if you are on social media and you want to follow us to be kept up to date with what we're doing as a region so any other events like this that we're doing do follow us on social media and we can keep you updated we have previously as well done a couple of other online events so if you are interested in those we did one on hbo1c one on bmi as well so the other care processes there's a link in the chat there as well I will just leave it for another minute to see if any more questions come through. Like I say, we do still have the time. So anything you want to, ah, Heidi, brilliant. Thank you. Um, does preeclampsia lead to CKD? Yeah, so we're looking at blood pressure territories in here. Yeah, possibly. Of course, you need, you know, then you will have to screen the person quite regularly to uh, rule out CKD. 
I guess the you know what I emphasized on on the call is really making sure that if you happen to be on the risk category and preeclampsia I would classify it as one that you would you would need that screening at least yearly. I just wanted to go back to Linda's point about glycemic variability. Sorry, I apologize because that is very close to my heart. Is um, if you are using a continuous glucose uh, sensor, that there is, uh, you know, there's a value that would be calculated to choose a coefficient of variation. So the idea of uh, keeping that at below 36% would reduce the risk of complication thing that's the consensus at the minute thank you thank you is it possible at all um linda's asked can you give us the link to your phd paper yes of course um let me just quickly find that sorry thank you linda been a light reading for you there linda <laughs> Um, I'll also just pop in the chat as well, just the link to, to our website as well. So if there's any further information you want to, to find out about anything at all to do with your diabetes, our website has some great resources on there as well. Um, whilst Helena is just finding the link, any other questions at all anybody has for Helena about kidneys? Okay, well, if there are no further questions, but oh, lovely, another one, brilliant. Um, okay, Helena, oh, lovely. Uh, right, so we have a question. Can you please explain the measurement used for GFR in Black Afro Caribbean? Thanks, Marilu, great question. Um, so up until 2021, uh, we were adjusting for race in calculating estimated glomerular filtration rate. We now no longer adjust that, and that is simply because, uh, if you like, race is a social political construct and has no base in terms of evidence of saying that this you know you should have a different adjustment for people from a black and uh, black background essentially um so we know that you know adjusting for race has contributed to inequalities in kidney care um you know that's been rectified from 2021 onwards the nice guideline advocates were not using a race adjustment in calculating the estimated glomerular filtration rate thank you Hi there, just this is Harry. Um that link you just shared, Helena, 10.10016, is that the link to your PhD? Uh so that was a link to my paper. It should have been the D or I What I can do, if you share that with me, um I can email it out to all the registrants when the video gets sent out. Yeah, sure, I could do that. I just popped in a link actually. Oh, perfect. Well, you've got the link now, so maybe that's null and void. Mm -hmm. Okay, are there any other questions at all? Okay, well, you're very welcome. Okay, well, if there are any other questions, ah, oh, yes, see, that's always the way I go to wrap up and then somebody asks a question, which is great. Is there more information about CKD in Black African linked to eye disease? More information, sorry, let me uh, try and understand the question, more information about CKD in Black African linked to eye disease. I'm um, not sure it's linked to a specific ethnicity, but it, you know, if you think about the damages in your eye are uh, to the small vessels and the same process happens in the kidney. So usually what I do in my Moorfield clinic on a Monday afternoon, if, uh, that means you've got significant retinopathy or myelopathy. Um, I take a great interest in looking at your urine tests and your obviously blood tests as well to just make sure that a if you have got kidney disease that we treat it early so we can uh, reverse that. Um, if you've already got established kidney disease, then we need to stabilise that. So 
when I talked about early intervention and using some of these agents that we now have, you, you know, you essentially are changing the disease pathway and helping people live better life out of complication and, you know, better quality of life, I suppose. So the link to the eyes and the kidneys is really the microvascular element, and that is not particularly linked into ethnicity. Thank you. No problem. Any more for any more? Any more questions? Ooh, what stage of kidney disease should medications be considered? Ah, Sophie, I like that. Um, for me, um, the earlier, the better, even better if we start it when you haven't actually got kidney disease. And that way we will be sure that you're not going to have kidney disease. So primary care colleagues, my primary care colleagues are key in this. So you see bulk of patients in, in the community. Um, I only see people when they have advanced diseases, both in my Moorfield role as well as my role at the Royal Free. So I very much would like to prevent that, at, you know, in the nicest possible way that if I don't see people in my clinics at Moorfield, that would be amazing and even better if I don't see anyone on dialysis. So I guess the, the, the earlier, the better. So if you've got type 2 diabetes, the key thing is you probably would not know when you had it and you may have lived with it for quite some time because it's you know one of those silent killers so um it's worth starting these treatments early uh, to prevent poor outcomes another question why does one have to wait until stage five before dialysis is offered Okay, so that's a guide, first of all, um, and it's usually because I now work predominantly in um, advanced CKD services, which is a low clearance and dialysis. It's very much symptom led rather than number led, if I'm uh, honest. So some people will be on a stage five, um, an EGFR of 14 and leave like that for some time. Some people are very symptomatic at that level where, you know, the shortness of breath, they're very tired, they're fluid overload, loaded. So it really depends on the symptoms and how one manages, and that's a, a good sort of guide for starting dialysis. Um, but, you know, it's not just a number, no, no nephrologist will say, look, you're under 15, you've got to go on dialysis tomorrow. There's also, you know, a whole consultation about what you want to do about your kidney disease. So not everybody will opt for uh, dialysis, which is quite right. Um, so people would like to be conservatively managed medically without dialysis intervention. Um, some people are put forward into transplant, which has a better outcome essentially, um, but there is a weight. Um, so it really is individualized. It's not just the number, I will say. Really okay. interesting questions coming later. <laughs> so I'm gonna hang around for another few minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, we've got another one coming in. Keep them coming. Um, my daughter was diagnosed type 1 three years ago at age 18, but despite constant nagging at the doctors, still has never been taught how to count carbs or manage her diabetes. If she can't get this basic care, what chance does she have of avoiding CKD? Amanda, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I wish your daughter well. Um, you know, I think teenagers are not easy. <laughs> um, I haven't got ch children who are teenagers, but I am warned that starts to come. Um, so, you know, it is, it's not easy. Um, and she, she has to be ready for it. And I guess, you know, pediatric service is not, as far as I'm aware, that structured education isn't offered as a group, but um, if you are in London and happen to live in the South London area, and I do think they do take uh, tertiary referrals, guys and Thomas's have a, a really quite good structured teenager thing spanning from somewhere about 14 to 25, um, you know, tailored education program with a lot of psychological support, wasn't it? Um, so worth having a look at that is what I would say. Um, 
you know, I guess not everybody will get CKD. I don't want to frighten people, but I guess, you know, it's, it's good to minimize the risk where possible. And then I guess in, in the, you know, in the field of type 1 diabetes, we now have hybrid closed loops. So hopefully that would itself should be able to help but you know knowing the carb counting and sometimes you know healthcare systems haven't been that um accessible for people because you know not everybody wants to be in a group education as well so there are online um carb counting courses that your daughter can tap into um when she is ready or able to or wanting to do it but I guess the answer to to this, to me at the minute, is at least the, the hybrid closed loop. I hope I answered your question, Amanda. Thank you, Helena. Um, Caroline's also put a link in the chat as well to an education course for people with type 1 about how to manage insulin doses and carb intake. So hopefully that can help a little bit there as well, Amanda. Thanks, Caroline. Um, Okay, we've got a couple more questions. Lovely. Um, if you're coming off, oh, excuse my pronunciation of this. I'm not. Don't uh, worry, don't pack this off. <laughs> if you're coming off dapagliflozin, so sorry, yes. to go onto a pump, does this mean that your kidney disease risk increases? Uh, and then they put in brackets, I know that this protects kidneys. So I think a couple of points to say. So we've now not got the license for using dapagliflozin in type one uh, people with type one diabetes. Um, although I know there's off license use of it for protection of kidneys, but there are ongoing trials at the minute looking at um, uh, the kidney protection or if you like cardiovascular protection of uh, people living with type one diabetes with SGLT2 inhibitors. So very much looking forward to looking at those data coming and changing of the licensing of this agent. Um, so if you come off it, your insulin requirement will probably go up. So that's something to, to watch out for. Um, essentially coming off it is yes, you will you would lose the protection of the you know the kidneys from that agent because you're no longer taking it. Um, but one to to think about, I guess, I, and it's not an easy one and it's not been made easy for us as healthcare professionals when you haven't got the license as well but i know quite a lot a lot of my diabetology colleagues um are using it off license as long as you you know sort of have an agreement and what to look out for testing for ketones and things like that thank you lovely thank you uh okay what things can be done apart from diet um to reverse ckd diet is important difficulties with food such as salt intake very difficult to cook sometimes and then they followed up by saying any non-pharmaceutical ways suggestions please yeah. well healthy eating exercise are key i guess salt intake is one that i normally say not not negotiable because i know it's it's not easy it's difficult but it's acquiring that um you know in your test but i suppose isn't it the longer you kind of eat, you know, less salty food and not adding extra and, you know, most foods will have salt in them normally. So, um, you know, the addition of the salt is what would actually affect uh, your kidneys because you're literally drawing out the water, um, your blood pressure will go up. So I guess that that's one then negotiable <laughs> if you can, and I know it's not easy. Um, and then, you know, keeping ideal weight, you know, they're not separate entities, they all go hand in hand. And it's not just for CKD, but just general, you know, well being and, you know, cardiovascular health. Um, exercising is key as well, it helps. Um, you know, if you're smoking, is one risk factor that's easily modifiable. I say easily, but you know, there are supports available. Um, if you're a smoker and, you know, thinking about, uh, quitting because uh, that would go a long way in terms of um, improving your health outcome. Um, the general advice in terms of diet really had shifted so much in, in kidney world, I would say, so that we now, you know, not everybody would need to restrict on potassium intake now, and unless potassium is an issue for you. Um, but salt is one that sort of stayed, um, I would say. 
Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, that's it for questions. Um, if anybody, oh, another one pops in. Um, is genetic linked to these for young people and adults? Just to follow on from what you've just said. Uh, yeah, so the polycystic kidney disease is a you know one example. So yes, that it did a rare other rare form of kidney disease um, that are you know linked genetically. Um, but you know in terms of you know, diabetes and risk factors, I guess the, the sort of complete risk factor is if you had. Um, acute kidney injury or had a family history that means that, you know, when of your parents were in dialysis and things like that, those, those are really risk factors that are in, in your essential DNA. So something to, to monitor for and look out for, um, you know, it's good that kidney disease by and large is not a young person's disease. It's usually, like I said, you know, 65 and above that you see um, chronic kidney disease, but you do we do have younger population with chronic kidney diseases, and then that's particularly within the type two population as well. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Harry's just reshared as well in the chat the links to our social media pages. So if you're on social media, please do follow us. You can be kept up to date. And there's also the links to the other events that we've done as well. Um, yes, there will be a, a recording. We will share a recording of this afterwards. So yes, it can be can be shared. Okay, I'm going to assume there's no more questions. Correct me if I'm wrong, pop them in the chat if you do still have them, but I will say thank you very much, Helena, for this talk today. It's been really interesting. Um, learned quite a lot. Um, everybody, we will be sending you out a recording of, of this. So like I said at the beginning, if there's things that you kind of missed or you think, oh, I could do with listening to that again, you've got the recording to be able to do so. We will as well be sending you out an evaluation form. Please do film this in. This is really useful for us to understand what you enjoyed about the event, anything else that you would like to hear in the future as well and do keep an eye on our social media pages as well we will be having some more online events coming up this year as well there are no questions coming through so i am going to close but just want to say again thank you very much elena for this talk today it's been really interesting and it looks like from the chat already everybody else has, has learned a lot as well and, and everybody's saying thank you so thank you to everybody for attending and we will close it here. Have a lovely rest of your day, everybody. Enjoy your lunch if you've not yet had it. And hopefully we'll see you on another event sometime soon. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.